I want to say thank you to Norman for doing this. This is our, uh, I think this is our biggest Zoom yet in terms of registrants. And it's about, uh, I see we got 91 on board right now. And that was about the, the most we ever hit when uh, Ken Kessler did this a year and a half ago, when Zooms were a new thing. Um, so I think it's a tribute to uh, your reputation um, and to your topic, noise and vibration from an audiophile's perspective. I think a lot of people are uh, interested in that. Uh, Norman, let's start. Um, you were in your bio, uh, I noticed you were a musician, a hi-fi shop owner, um, designer at MIT Cables, consultant at Skywalker Ranch, technical manager at uh, Owens Cor Corning. Um, that's just an amazing background. And uh, that, do you think, is, does that make you uniquely suited to do what you're doing now, which is kind of uh, bridging the uh, pro audio, um, studio audio and, and audiophile consumer worlds? Yeah, yeah, I think that, um... I like that you see that parallel because that's what is of interest to me um, is correlating um, sonic attributes with um, uh, measurements. And so that's been something of interest to me for, you know, for decades. And, and one of my pursuits, especially while at, um, at Owens Corning in the Science and Technology Center. Um, and then, you know, through uh, various uh, associations trying to make changes that, you um, will be of benefit. Now, this, you know, this takes generations to do when you're trying to uh, correlate subjective with objective measurements. But um, that is something that, especially in, in our industry, we need to work on so that we are all communicating better and, and, um, and more on the same page. Uh, so yes, that that's, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, because of my background, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it makes right. sense. <laughs> yeah, you're an audiophile who actually knows and understands measurements. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. and music and, and music, and right. all of that, yeah. Right, and there are a few people like you around, but not too many, so that that's wonderful. Um, when, and I, I should also mention your website, uh, um, AV Room Service, and recommend it to people. I really love the uh, the the videos you have. If people go to avroomservice.com, you can see go to acoustics and then there's a pull down to get to videos. And there's some fascinating things and to uh, to not waste your time with lots of good <laughs> lots of good stuff there. <laughs> um, and you know, and some interesting products. Like you know, we first learned about it through. Um, Bob Katz, uh, the mastering uh, engineer and uh, former recording engineer for Chesky, who highly recommends your uh, your EVP uh, isolators, um, actually did measurements with his speakers and wrote an uh, audio engineering society paper about it. So they're really very effective. Um, and that's been around for a while, but I, I really urge people to uh, take a look at AV Room Service. So now, Norman, I'll let you uh, do the screen share thing and start your presentation. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this. All right. So I'm going to be covering noise and vibration from an audiophile's perspective. And we are going to cover what the fundamental sound quality attributes are for a critical listening environment how far off the typical listening environment is from the desired, what these sonic attributes mean to the experience, how these sound quality characteristics are measured, and solutions to common problems. We're gonna talk about fundamentals, meaning we are, are talking about large obstacles that get in the way of our experience. And we have to get rid of those large obstacles. Um, we have to do the coarse tuning before we can do the fine tuning. And there's a hierarchy regarding that. There's a, a, a priority checklist, if you will. In other words, we, we, if we don't follow that hierarchy, 
then we are not going to gain the, the benefits that are, are available. We're gonna break this up into two primary sections. The first half, we're gonna talk about acoustic noise and vibrations. And the second half, we're gonna talk about electronic noise and vibrations. And we're gonna talk about specifications and, and meaningless versus meaningful. And what I mean by that is that there are specification sheets that we tend to, to drool over, study, um, uh, for example, uh, total harmonic distortion of an amplifier, you know, oh, this one's got 0 0.00 and this one's 0 0.006 or, or whatever. Um, damping factor, slew rates, you know, things like that, that are, they're important, sure, but they're, um, they're not important if we can't hear them, right? And uh, we typically can't hear those things because our environment is, is in the way. So when I say meaningless versus meaningful, meaningful specifications, the ones that are really important are the ones, the acoustical um, measurements in our room. Those are totally getting in the way of the, the specification sheets, if you will, of the equipment. So do you know, for example, what the ambient noise floor is in your environment? Do you know what the reverberation times are in your environment? Do you know what the ground impedance is for your electrical system? So this is a, this is a big bold statement here. And really, I believe this is a conservative statement. My experience says, I would say that more than 90% of the audiophiles are experiencing less than 50% of their equipment's potential. And that's because of the acoustic and or electrical environment getting in the way. So you put this big investment in and typically we're forgetting about what's most important. So why is this? I believe there are several reasons for this. One, they, they may be inexperienced as to the potential. I think any of us have, regarding anything really, until you've experienced it, you don't know what the possibilities are. Secondly, they may be unaware of what the obstacles are preventing a better experience. They may not have, know how to control those obstacles. There may be constraints preventing them from achieving their goals. They may be, uh, they may, may be wife acceptance factor, or they might be um, budgetary, or they might be physical constraints, or, or maybe they're in a, a rental, um, and so they can't do certain things. But I think one of the biggest ones is they are told the answer is to buy better equipment. And what happens there is you end up just chasing your own tail because you're not addressing the problem. So another way to, well, so what are audiophiles doing in the meantime? So looking at this chart on the left-hand side, this is the typical action taken to improve the audio experience versus on the right-hand side, this is the typical impact on the audio experience. And if you look at those, they're almost flipped. So on the left-hand side, the action that's typically taken is new equipment, upgrades, tweaks. There is very little interior acoustic treatment or physical setup addressed, um, very little vibration isolation or resonance damping. And that the typical impact on the experience is quite different. The interior acoustic treatments and the physical setup, that's the priority. And next to that is gonna be vibration isolation, resonance damping. And once you've got that under control, now you can start addressing new equipment, upgrades and, and tweaks. Now, again, I'm totally generalizing, you know, but you can't have, for, well, for example, let's say you've got um, state-of-the-art equipment and it's in a typical environment you know that that investment is not going to perform up to its potential. On the other hand, if I had mid-fi and I had it set up right in a controlled environment, 
that's going to outperform the state of the art equipment every time. Another way to look at this is, is, is this, for example, and you know, this is my philosophy that setup calibration and acoustics outweigh electronics. You, you, you can't turn it the other way around. So in the, this explanation, you know, in our scenario, who's the audiophile? And in my book, it's a person desiring to recreate the artist's musical work accurately through an audio playback system in a small room. So what defines a small room? In our audiophile scenario, it's a space that, meet, that meets the following criteria. One, can apply sound source frequencies whose wavelengths are longer than the longest dimension of the space, incorporates shorter decay rates than performance spaces, has strong early reflections compared to the direct sound. So those are the criteria for a, a small room. In, our, in addition, our typical audiophile room includes the following acoustic characteristics. One, decay rates that are unique and vary wildly by frequency. And we'll get into this here, but everybody's room, um, if, if it's not under control, is unique as uh, our voice or um, our, our signature or thumbprint. They're all different and we don't want that. We want to have some control. We want to have some neutrality. Um, unique room modes, I think most of us are, are familiar with that as well. Um, high ambience noise floor, something that we're often not addressing because we typically don't know how. And only a standard electrical service, and that's definitely limiting us. <clears throat> so ideally, the goal is for a neutral environment, one that doesn't add or subtract one that does not introduce unwanted vibrations. Sound is vibration. Unwanted vibrations are those other than the direct airborne sound waves from the speakers of the recorded signals. And that can include reflections, appliances, footfalls, electrical noise, plumbing, outside noise, resonances, buzzes and rattles, etc. Vibrations can also be caused by mechanical and electrical interference. So a neutral environment is our goal. The foundation is our reference for making value judgments, right? So if it is skewed, if the environment's um, acoustically skewed, so are our judgments. And if it is skewed, so is our experience, or rather our experience is going to be limited. So here's a, this is your average listening room versus the desired. So we'll go through these step by step. The average listening room noise floor, ambient noise floor, meaning um, the HVAC is on, all the equipment is on. Um, you're talking about a 40 dB SPL A weighted. Ideally, we would like to get down to about 18 dB. So that's a significant increase. So dynamic range, low level detail, that's, uh, that's being buried in the typical audio room. Dynamic range, 60 dB on average and achievable without, well, I mean, it can be expensive. And of course, everyone's ambient noise floor is different, but chiefly we can get to 82 dB. That's a significant increase, right? 22 dB, that's huge. Reverberation times, typically they'll vary um, by more than a second across the audio bandwidth. And we would like them to be controlled by less than, point, than 0 0.4 seconds across the audio bandwidth. And we'll go into that further. Room modes, typically you're gonna see swings of 25, even 30 dB of, you know, with, uh, with the room modes. And we would like to, they're going to exist. It's a contained environment. We can't get rid of that, but we can control them um, without, without too much trouble, typically down to uh, making them about plus or minus five dB. Vibration isolation, and you know, this is a, this is a big one. 
um, and we'll talk about more of it too. And, and I think kind of a kind of a new topic uh, for uh, for audiophiles. The typical audiophile isn't dealing with it at all, and ideally, we would like to mitigate ninety percent of it anyway. So what can we expect under such conditions? Well, with, with noise floor, we're gonna be limited our dynamic range. We're going to be masking low level resolution and we're going to be experiencing distractions that might be again, like we heard, you know, um, footballs or the plumbing or the HVAC turning on or off. It's a, you know, sometimes the HVAC is on, we're not even realizing it, we're totally in the zone and then it turns off <laughs> and we go, ah, oh, you know, um, reverberation times, again, masking of low level details, limited dynamic range and core intelligibility. We're gonna go into that a little bit further too. Rim modes, discuss those already, nonlinear base response and in articulation. Um, not sure if that's actually a word, but I'm going for it. Um, mechanical isolation, everything in the room has resonances. Uh, especially, for example, the, the big ones are going to be your structural resonances. In the U.S., in our typical two by four with layer of sheetrock construction, if you go in between the, the joists and um, the studs, rather, and give a light fist bump with two by four, eight foot ceilings, you're, well, that airspace, you're talking about 70 hertz. Um, you're going to hear that played back. Any, it'll play back in sympathy and later in time, anytime you play back music that has 70 hertz in it, which is pretty much anything, any music that you might play back. And what's interesting is that resonance is the wall takes that energy and it stores it for a bit. It acts like a capacitor, really. So it takes that energy, stores it for a little bit, and then releases it later after the original event has stopped. So not only does your room drone at say 70 Hertz or whatever the issue is, but it does so later in time after the original event has stopped. Um, what's interesting also about mechanical structural is that the denser the material that the vibration is transferring through, the further and the faster it moves. So let's say I'm, it could be a concrete floor it could be a, a wood floor, it, it doesn't matter. You, you, when we play music and our speakers are coupled to, let's say the floor, the first thing that arrives to us, and this is gonna be through our chair and through our butt and through you know, bone conduction, is the structural, um, um, in other words, pre, I guess you'd say pre-delay. That's the first arrival time. The second arrival time is the direct airborne sound from the speakers to our ears. And then the third is the, the structure returning energy later in time. So with, with um, isolation, you have a lot of um, information that is unwanted being mitigated. Very few people have experienced that. And um, it's, it's, it's quite, I mean, it, it, as we'll see, it, uh, it hits every sonic attribute in a pretty significant way. So mechanical isolation also will get rid of buzzes and rattles that might be in the room and even tracking errors of a turntable or a CD, um, even tube electronics, they're microphonic. You can go on and on. There's a lot of it, even connections benefit from um, vibrations being mitigated. So under such conditions, can we expect to hear subtle equipment changes? Can we expect to make bare assessments? Might we be compensating for system anomalies? And those anomalies might be the room modes, the resonances, noise floor, reverberation. I've been to many uh, um, reviewers' um, environments to help them with their acoustics. And, and so then after doing so, I know, you know how their room performs. And so then when I read reviews, I can kind of read in between the lines and, and have a better, I have a much better understanding of what they're hearing because I know of their, um, I know what their environment is, is contributing to um, the fidelity. So the acoustical objectives are going to be to make the room 
sonically disappear in the playback system and control the influence of structure-borne and airborne sound vibrations. So the problems in a small contained environment, sound waves propagate through the space at the mercy of the size, shape, the construction materials and methods, furnishings, etc. Every object will resonate, reflect, absorb, and transmit energy. Most of the energy is returned back into the listening space. In a typical environment, most of the sound you hear is returned energy. In addition, there is a considerable percentage of audible sound sources that are unrelated to the playback recording. <clears throat> so solutions, newer methods of acoustic measurements, and boy, have we come a long way since, um, really since uh, about 1980. You know, we've got measurement tools available to us that have really excelled. Um, but prior to that, so in other words, not long ago at all, uh, we had very little to work with as far as um, acoustic measurements for our application. Modeling too, computer modeling, and even acoustic treatments are available that offer means of controlling sound waves in an organized, controlled fashion that's predictable. That's a key word right there. If we understand how um, sound is propagating in an environment and the materials that make up the environment, then we can begin to understand how to control it. Uh, so the results are an elevated and superior audio experience that better represents the artist's intent. And that's what that's the goal of us, right? That's what we're after. We want to get closer to the artist's intent and get the most out of our investment, have the most fun, enjoy it <laughs> to the maximum capability. Now this slide's a bit busy and I don't really want you to, to you know, um, to break it apart, but I, I for example, the, um, the perforated or dotted box, those are all pretty expensive things to do. Down below that, um, these are things that the typical audio file can address. So you're looking at the acoustic control in the left column, the control measures in the middle and the control benefit on the right. And so, Speaker listener positions, for example, it, you know, we're gonna control that with the, the room locations, uh, listen to bass response, speaker toe in, um, speaker angles, that's gonna benefit soundstage and timbre. First order reflections, we're gonna address that with absorption or diffusion, and that's gonna help with spatiality and timbre. Reverberation times, we're gonna address that with absorption, and that's gonna help with resolution and dynamics. And the big one that I want to talk about here, and this is new probably to a lot of people, is loudspeaker structural vibration transfer of resonances, rattles, buzzes, and pre-echoes. And this is done with mechanical isolation. We're talking about decoupling. We are not talking about coupling. And this affects all the sonic, the sound quality attributes. Articulation. Soundstage, resolution, dynamic, spatiality, and timbre. So this, I thought this would be of interest if, if we have, let's say, I mean, any of these issues can be addressed in a scientific manner. And for example, with a noise solution strategy, this is how you go about it. So the first step is we're going to evaluate the noise environment under the existing or the expected conditions. And that means we're gonna understand the means of each noise path in terms of octave band sound levels. We're going to measure or model the sound energy levels, spectra, contribution of each path. And we're going to measure or model the total noise octave band spectrum at the receiver location. Step two, determine the acceptable noise level or criterion at the receiver location. Step three, obtain the difference between the noise energy in step 1C and step two. Four, prioritize each noise path contribution in regards to the goal. Five, establish physical budgetary decor, local code and resource constraints. And finally, evaluate various design material solutions that will meet the objective goals. So again, when we're talking about 
organizing from chaotic sound. There's a, um, a, there's a step, there's a procedure that you need to follow. This is an idea of um, noise control and the various applications that can be applied. Let's say we've got a, a noisy appliance. This, in this case, this is a copier. There's a lot of things that we can do to address that noisy copier for the receiver to benefit from. We can, uh, number one is we can line it with, a, with a, a partial enclosure. We can get a quiet copier, of course. We can include duct, the absorption material, uh, sound absorption around the room. We can put up a partition, uh, an acoustic barrier. Um, we can add white noise. We can incorporate structural breaks for isolation of vibration. We can even include earplugs. So that's, and then typically we're going to address this uh, in a number of ways. And the whole idea is, is to discover what ways are going to benefit most. So here's our typical dynamic range in, in a typical residence. We talked earlier about 40 dB SPL. So in the dark blue, you're going, you see that there's a, um, a, an area where all that information below, uh, well, covering it below 40 dB is masked. That area is masked by the typical noise floor. That's a lot of low level detail. That's a, a, a lot of information that, we, that is there, but we are not hearing. So we are hearing about 60 dB of dynamic range. And we could be hearing 82 dB of dynamic range. That's a lot more amplification power, right? That's a, a lot more information. Um, <clears throat> percentage wise, it's a lot more information than we're getting. Um, be interesting to, to, to um, kind of figure that out. I'd say it's probably about 50% of the information we're missing because we're covering it up with, the, uh, with our ambient noise floor. This is what is called a, um, a noise criteria curve. And this is a measurement that we do in, in residents where um, we have the HVAC on, we have the equipment on, um, in other words, normal ambient. Now this particular customer had an existing NC25 rather than what we just saw in the slide would be more like an NC40. Um, we were able to improve it by various means down to an NC20. So we got a 5 dB increase there. Um, and of course, you, you always wanna look at these um, curves. So in other words, you wanna see um, the, the level over frequency. So you know what, uh, what you're referring to, not just a single number. And in acoustics, we're always dealing with single numbers, and, and that really doesn't give you the information. You have to look at curves. Um, so with this 5 dB increase, you know, if you think about it, <clears throat> we more than doubled the guy's amplifier um, capabilities, right? That's pretty huge. That's pretty significant. This slide is, is um, kind of arbitrary, but... Uh, I put together this because I thought it, it would just be of interest. It's, um, you know, how we were talking about reverberation times are as unique as our voice or, or signature or, or thumbprint. Everybody's room has a different reverberation time unless it's under control. Well, I took 50 um, rooms and this is your average. So of those 50, and these were media rooms that then we addressed. So this is before acoustic treatment. This is what we were dealing with. And uh, you can see the, they're, they're terrible. They're to totally out of control. To the point where if I said, for example, and in, in your, this is about speech intelligibility. If I said the word bat or bath or bad, or you know anything similar to that, where the consonant is covered up by the reverberation times, it's very hard to understand what was said. If we can control the reverberation times, then that consonant is no longer masked and we can hear it. 
So that's just kind of a, a graphical explanation of what I've been talking about as far as masking information. And <clears throat> this is when we do reverberation times in a room, you typically will do multiple uh, um, measurements in multiple locations. Like for example, in, in this, I, I know in this particular one, there were nine reverberation um, locations in the room. You take them so that you're getting out of room modes and, and you're, you're getting more of an average of the room. Um, and including that would be the, the critical listening, the, the primary listening seat. You can see now this room, it has a general you know, um, curve and it's crazy, right? It's out of control. And you can also see it's different at each of the nine locations. Now, the graph below is after we treated the room, they are the exacts, and, and each of these nine locations is going to be measured at least three times minimum to get, to get an average. Down below are the same locations, same, um, um, the same room now treated, and you can see now it's, it's under control. It's where we want it you can see a little tail in the low frequencies. And this is desirable in an anechoic, uh, in a totally, this is just a psychoacoustic deal. Um, at, at Owens Corning, I often had to give little tours to, um, to VIPs talking about the research that we were performing. And we had a, a fully anechoic chamber. And uh, there are uh, many people that, walk into such an environment and, um, and they get sick to their stomach quick <laughs> and uh, can't stand it and, and have to, to leave. The reason is, is that um, what their eyes and what their ears see do not correlate. They're not used to it. And uh, it make, it's confusing to the point where they get sick to their stomach. Um, what's you know, interesting is that when we put on headphones or when we're outside, we're talking about anechoic in environments and we don't experience that. But when we have a, an experience, when we have a memory experience of what the room we're looking at should sound like, and it's not sounding like it should, it doesn't correlate. It confuses us to the point where it, we have an emotional response. So to have a, a little bit extra uh, decay time in the low frequencies can definitely be to our advantage. And, and how much those are, again, it's gonna depend on the size of the space and we want them to be controlled. <clears throat> um, an, another point to, uh, to talk about is, now this is a different room. If you look at the yellow curve, the, uh, hopefully you can see that, that was the room, this is a, a, a real room that had carpet and, uh, and furnishings. So again, the reverberation times are, are out of control. The red line that you see there was me trying to treat this as best as possible. In other words, optimizing um, one inch fiberglass panels. Now one or two inch fiberglass panels are only going to be effective down to about 500 Hertz. And what typically happens is we'll end up over absorbing from 500 and up, and we are not touching 500 and down. So in other words, we're over treating the top half of the keyboard and we're not touching the lower half of the keyboard. Now the green curve is showing our FRP system, our frequency response panel system. And it's, uh, it's right, in line with where we want it. So it's, it's a controlled environment. This is another test that's uh, called the music articulation test tone. And it's a 16th of a second, it's a gated sweep, 16th of a second on, 16th of a second on. And I just took this particular um, area from about 500 to 600 Hertz because um, it showed, so when you're listening to it, it goes do, 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 and when it is um, bef before treatment, in other words, in the red graph, it would sound more like do, 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 do. it would slur. And so with treatment, you can see that it's very articulate. The, the frequency starts and stops quick. 
So this is um, th this is our equipment vibration protectors, and this is done in a lab. So the only thing that is being tested is the um, is the device itself. There's nothing else in the system. There is not on a resting platform or or anything else. The accelerometer is right below the de device under test, and it's hit with an impulse hammer. Um, below is a, an aluminum cone. And what I want to point out here is that when we're talking about something that is solid, something that is rigid, we are talking about coupling and we are going to be introducing resonances. So for example, um, you may find that uh, um, a solid such device under the, you know, as a, a footer under your equipment sounds different. And you're correct, and it will sound different every single time if it's if it's not isolating and, and if it's not decoupling and rather coupling. Every device is going to have um, resonances where it will exaggerate, it will amplify frequencies, and those are very audible. So every every rigid foot under every different load under every different resting platform is going to perform differently and sound different. And again, not what we want. We want neutrality. So when we are in an environment where we are coupling to the floor, it goes to the entire structure because the entire structure is, is hard fastened. Um, and so it resonates and plays back and it can even bother other people. When we isolate, uh, as you can see with decouplers under the, the uh, source of vibration, then the rest of the structure is not vibrating. So from an acoustical upgrades, one listener, speaker and listener locations are free. We can get the bass optimized and then we can work on the sound stage and the timbre by, play, by positioning ourselves and, and our speakers optimally inside the room. Isolating the speakers, I'd say, would be the second benefit, um, the second biggest benefit. Um, moderate costs, it, it's going to isolate the structure. It quiets the room from cavity resonances, buzzes and rattles, and improves articulation and, and all attributes. And as a side benefit, it will not annoy people. You might have a, um, a, a, somebody trying to sleep above or study or, or whatever the structure is not going to be transmitting those low frequencies to them. Acoustic treatments can be inexpensive to expensive. And ideally you're, you wanna control the first order reflections and that's gonna simultaneously control reverberation times, but then you're gonna to wanna to work on getting the, um, the rest of the reverberation times under control. And then structural treatments, these are gonna be more expensive. And this is more about um, material methods and, um, and materials. Um, and dimensions of the, the structure uh, and, and how they address room modes and or sound transmission. So it's also going to affect how noise infiltrates or escapes from the environment. So now we'll talk about electrical fundamentals and the average room versus the desired. Ground resistance. The NEC allows 25 ohms, um, but typically, especially with older places. I wonder if I'm too dark there. That's probably a, an advantage. Um, you know, older construction and so forth. Um, you rarely see 25 ohms. It's usually higher than that. And we would like to have five ohms or, or less. Peak current capability will typically, and, and again, this is actually uh, really conservative, less than 500 amps, less than 400 amps is, is more what I see. And we would like to have more than a thousand voltage distortion, more than 10%. We'd like to see less than five common mode distortion, more than two volts. Typically we want to have less than 10 millivolts, normal mode noise, more than four volts. And typically we would like to have, or rather typically more than four volts. And we would like to have less than 50 millivolts harmonic content. It's all over the place. We would like to have less than 3% at the third harmonic and really nothing above that. Electrical isolation, we typically don't have any at all. And we would like to incorporate all that's possible. 
So electrical issues can vary from introducing audible hiss, buzz, hum, and or other interference type noises to introducing anomalies that limit performance of the equipment, even causing errors or, or damage. Some of these are less obvious, but more common issues with poor quality AC manifests itself as sound, the sound sounding flat and thin, edgy, harsh, et cetera. And again, a lot of people have never experienced anything but, so they don't know the potential of their, what their equipment is actually capable of, of doing. So again, under such conditions, can we expect to hear subtle equipment changes? You know, if I make a change to, uh, I don't know, a, an interconnect or something, might not be able to hear the difference because other things are, are in the way. Can we expect to make a fair assessment? No. Might we be compensating for system anomalies? Yeah. <laughs> um, so electrical objectives, we want to minimize the potential to ground. We want to maximize the current delivery. We want to minimize power factor error and K factor issues, minimize line coupled EMI and RFI noise, minimize field coupled EMI and RFI noise, isolate critical components from the main service and from each other and provide optimum safety for personnel and equipment. So the problems, again, newer test and measurement equipment reveal problems previously undetected. Many of the old methods of grounding, bonding, and shielding are unreliable, especially with today's sensitive digital equipment and cause noise, glitches, errors, loss of information, and even damage. The trend of lower voltage circuitry with higher density integrated circuits and more RAM is increasing and increasing clock speed will continue. So it's, it's more critical as technology marches on. The solution, there are newer methods of AC grounding, filtration, isolation, bonding, and shielding that will improve safety as well as the audio equipment performance, reliability, and, and longevity. So the results, along with the safety and equipment improvements, the end user will experience greater dynamics, speed, resolution, and imaging in both the audio and the video presentation. What are some general electric recommend, electrical recommendations? In general, you want to oversize everything. And another thing I want to stress is don't condition unless it's required. We have so many um, you know, line conditioners uh, power conditioners that are that are bought, and um, uh, you, you just want to be careful there. You don't want to be buying filters that you don't need. Um, uh, you know, filters on top of filters are 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 not a good thing. Ideally, we want to have a very pure system um, and one that uh, that has anything that's unnecessary removed. So caution as far as, you know, buying just any old power conditioner and, you know, they're all different. They all do different things and they do different things in different ways. And we just want to be careful that we aren't getting things that we actually don't want. We want to address the issue that we have and nothing else. Uh, so again, overrate everything. So heavier cables, circuit breakers, all that kind of thing. Um, clean any visible corrosion or carbon deposits on, on the on the grounding rod junction, bus bars, breakers, replace if old or has tripped many times or outlets, gas tighten or exothermically weld all the connections where you can, you know, the grounding rod, um, uh, those connections should certainly be exothermically welded. Um, and try and avoid other AC um, and signal cables by about five feet and try and cross it at, at, uh, at right angles and isolate when you can. This is something that's uh, usually free and, and easy to do and can have a huge impact on, your, on the performance. Uh, so in summary, good signal, signal integrity means flowing unimpeded throughout the chain. And the three ingredients for this recipe are quality materials, large, smooth, clean, dry contact surface areas, and tight connections. Um, so here's some real examples. This is measured at the grounding electrode, and this is the, the resistance of a before and after. So this, at, at this residence, um, I measured 142 ohms. 
Now, if you remember, the NEC wants to see 25. With sensitive um, electronics, we want to see five or less. So after, uh, after treatment, we, we ended up with 0 0.53 ohms. Uh, and, and that treatment there, that was just, we added two more technical uh, ground rods to, um, to his existing. Um, so that's all that it took. It was not expensive. Um, in this instance, we've got uh, voltage harmonics and you can see many of them on the left-hand side. And on the right side, you don't see really anything, a little bit on the, on the third harmonic. Um, and here what we did was we in, improved the, the quality and the configuration of his circuits and isolated it from his existing panel. Again, not an expensive upgrade. And here, now this, we added an isolation transformer, a, a balanced, um, you know, separately derived system. And so here's common mode noise before and after. Um, uh, 6.3 millivolts versus point. 0 0.001. So clean that up considerably. And common mode noise is uh, pretty pretty common again, especially with the newer technologies, and uh, and can be problematic. So regarding electrical upgrades, uh, ground resistance often less than a thousand dollars. Lower the impedance means less reflected noise in the system. New cabling moderate to expensive. Quality wire configure and configurations and connections mean less interference, less resistivity, and better impedance matching. And then stepping up to an isolation transformer, you know, you're looking, depending on your system, 10 to 20K. A separately derived system means dedicated clean power, and you're no longer subjected to the grid. So um, we're almost at the end here. This slide is showing you the what I call the, the playback priority pyramid. And so on the bottom of this pyramid, you're preparing the ground and you're doing that by controlling the physical noises and vibrations and electrical noises. Then building on top of that is your foundation. You're gonna optimize physical layout, your room listener speakers for best space and imaging. You're gonna make sure your equipment is operating to specification and it is properly calibrated. Again, going back to optimizing um, the speaker listener positions, if you've got just a, a portable boom box and you're off to the side of it, you're not going to hear stereo. You're not going to have much of an image. So it's, it's critical that we get these steps in order. Um, then optimizing acoustic treatments for rim modes and first order reflections and reverberation times. Now we can start tweaking. Now we can start isolating um, other components, you know, not just the source, not just the speakers or subwoofers, but the electronics. And we can start isolating um, the uh, electrical fields as well. Now we can start looking at upgrading the equipment. Now we have what we have is a neutral controlled environment. And so now we can feel confident with uh, what we subjectively hear as a change is, is um, is a true change and not just a, a um, that is a true improvement and not just a, a difference in sound. So the takeaways on this presentation are, there are fundamental sound quality attributes which are known and measurable. The typical listening room is pretty far from ideal, which lowers the performance of the equipment and the experience for the listener. There's a hierarchy to achieving sound quality. Course changes are required before fine tuning can be perceived. Only a neutral environment can offer a fair playing field. And the, the biggest obstacles are often the smallest costs. So I, you know, as Mark mentioned, go to this website and there's, uh, there's many articles and videos that will get into more details of this um, general presentation. And it also has our, um, our, you know, our available products and, and services for these solutions. Um, so that's it. Thank you. And now we will open it up to any questions and I will stop sharing. That probably opened up a lot of questions because there was a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, who's up? Uh, Bob Fennerin, you're first. You want to uh, unmute and ask away? Yeah. Yeah, Bob Fennerin, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. My question deals with something you haven't addressed, and that is relative humidity. My, uh, yeah. my site varies from 20% up to 80% as the year progresses. Can you address any of that, please? Yeah, um, humidity as far as, for example, absorption uh, characteristics and materials uh, plays a, an important factor. And you're right, for example, when we test materials, we record the humidity and hopefully the, the lab has it under control. So usually you'll find in labs, they're enclosed hard, uh, you know, concrete environments and they can, they can sweat. And so you, you have dehumidifiers running all the time, except for during a test. Um, but yes, temperature and as well as humidity does play a role on, on how we hear things. In uh, temperature to a less extreme in a, in a small space, but, um, but humidity definitely plays a role. And so those of us who are in very humid conditions, I would suggest if you have a dedicated space that uh, you incorporate a dehumidifier, such as I do. Um, and in Columbus here, it gets humid. And so I have a dehumidifier and I run that um, on automatic. And, uh, and turn it off when I'm running tests or when I'm listening to music. Thanks, Bob. Uh, John Bratton, you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, Mark, thanks. Norm, thank you very much. This has been great. I've got two questions. Uh, the first one deals with uh, not so much the electrical, but the uh, acoustic treatments and isolation. This is a very crowded space. And I mean this question most respectfully. Um, why you and not HRS, critical mass, GIK, isoacoustics, uh, Wilson uh, pedestals, or whatever? And I've got one more question. Oh, why? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. Why? Why what? Against why? Them? Why AV room? Why your company? Uh -huh. And not everyone else and his brother that's in this space. <clears throat> okay, well, um, so the way I would answer this is, is I mean, there's a whole lot of, talking about our equipment vibration protectors, that, that particular product, there's a <laughs> lot of competition out there. Um, but I would say that most of them are not isolators. They are not decoupling. They are coupling, and uh, this is a uh, this is a big one. Just in our uh, let's say audiophile world, this is not something that is misunderstood in the noise and vibration world, or even the pro audio world. You do not find couplers under vibration sources like speakers or, or subwoofers. Why this is. I've got, you know, ideas as to why that is. I think that, you know, it started out with, uh, with couplers and, and people went, oh, this sounds different. And when, remember, I, I showed you a graph that shows how every different coupler is going to have different resonances in the audible range. And so those peaks are, they're amplifying the sound. So when we put them under our equipment, it's louder. And us audiophiles, I think in general, have the feeling that if it's louder, and I haven't changed my volume control or anything, it must be better. But it is not, it's only different. As a matter of fact, it's not accurate, and nor is it predictable or repeatable. Um, the equipment vibration protectors are, they're neutral, they're predictable, they're repeatable, no, one, no matter what other variable um, is introduced in the system. Now, the other thing that I, that I wanna point out is that any acoustical product should be uh, third party through an accredited acoustic lab. There's, there's standard tests for this. They should all be published. All of our acoustical products are published on the website and available for you to see. 
I don't know of a single competitor as far as an isolation product in the audiophile world that publishes their results. And that should be suspect. It's not right. It shouldn't be uh, occurring. And, and that's something that, um, that I, 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 I just don't understand. Okay. And, and, and that's fine. I appreciate that. My, my second and last question is, um, uh, and I know it varies depending upon size of room and there's all kinds of variables and stuff, but you've done a lot of this. Rule of thumb, any of us that wanted to take you up on what you did here, maybe exclusive of the, of the electrical stuff, room treatments, reverberation times, whatever, what should we be budgeting for something like this? Uh, tough question, John. Um, it depends on the, uh, the depends on the space. Obviously, it depends on the size of the space. Depends on um, so so many factors. I depends would guess how- that most of us have bedroom size things going on. We don't have have ballrooms, you know. So yeah. I, I mean, just I mean, is this a, a four thousand? Is this twenty thousand? Is this fifty thousand? What are we talking about here? <laughs> It, it is a really tough question, and I'm, I'm happy to help people uh, do things that are inexpensive, like, um, you know, I mean, area rugs or uh, bookcases or large leaf plants as diffusers. There are curtains. There's a lot of things that can be done that are inexpensive that are going to help a lot. It just depends on how much control you want, how bad the situation is. Obviously, the, the, uh, the surface area that we're, we're needing to, uh, to address and the frequencies. Um, the smaller the room, then yeah, as far as mids and highs, cheaper to, to address, but as far as lows, more and more difficult. Norm answered earlier when Bob was asking about uh, high humidity. Uh, in the wintertime, you typically have low humidity uh, down to like 10 or 20% and a lot of static issues. Uh, how would you address that, Norm? Um, well, there you're talking about uh, electrical issues and especially regarding um, electromagnetic fields around cables, AC cables, uh, power supplies, uh, signal cables. And, and so rather than an acoustic issue, now we're talking about an electrical issue. And we do offer a, a product that does address that called the cable vibration protectors. They do mechanical isolation and then cables that are on the floor um, you know, like for loudspeakers or maybe interconnect, the, the jacket acts as an electromagnetic coupler. When you take, and, and this is on the, the website, uh, there's a, a video and it shows a device that measures the static electricity. And um, if I take the cable and lift it off the ground, um, off of the, the, the ground, you can see that the static um, charge goes up. If I put it back on the ground, it's coupled. It now goes to zero. So we want to address the mechanical and we don't want that. You know, how perceptual that interference is, I haven't any idea, but I know it's it's not good. Um, so anyway, we have a, um, a product that addresses that. We also have a product that has a jacket that does just the opposite. So now it is a mechanical and electromagnetic isolator. So you can use it behind interconnects, like behind your preamp where you've got maybe a power cord Oh, or maybe you're trying to isolate digital from analog, or maybe even just right and left. All right, thank you. Uh, Arnie Balgalvis, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Arnie Balgalvis. Uh, what is a typical visit to someone's uh, listening room to eval- just to get down to the basics of what is, shall we say, what are the current situ- what is the current situation in a room so that one can decide what measures to take. Right, yeah. Um, so an on-site visit is about $4,000 and that comes with a, a report, but there is an awful lot that I can do um, just from photographs of the room. So, you know, you can, you can, <laughs> you can private message me and, um, and tell me what the, the problem is in your mind uh, if you've got a particular issue. And I can tell so much just from a few photographs so usually that's where I start. And then I'll often send you a, a questionnaire. And what I'm trying to do is, is determine what, it, what are the sonic issues that you think you, you are dealing with and maybe to what extent and maybe learning what, um, what those 
how to address those issues before coming out there. So sometimes I can, you know, I can help you out uh, without coming out on site. Obviously, coming out on site with test instruments is the best. But nowadays, um, uh, there are even some things I can tell you to do um, to to help me evaluate uh, um, without coming out there. Thank you. So, Steve, go ahead. Uh, you mean me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, somebody, I, somebody I, I, wanna, of you, but. I just want to thank uh, <laughs> the gentleman who we're all talking about, Norm, because I have a system that I decided at one point to add a couple of subwoofers into at the recommendation of a dealer. And, and I understood what it was likely to affect, but I had the un unintended uh, situation of causing a lot of vibrations in the room. And then I learned from Steve Sharp, who's a member of our group and a writer for TAS, uh, to look into Norm's products. And I put a pair, I should say, two sets of four EVPs under my subs. And lo and behold, suddenly the room was quieter again, more accessible. more. And then I said, I'll put those upstairs under my uh, you know, Rebel Salons and my sub, my SVS sub. And sure enough, you know, everything was tamed. And... So all I can say is that the stuff works, it's important. And even beyond that, we often don't know what our problems are until they go away. And so <laughs> that's part of the, the challenge that we all have is trying to figure out, well, can I make an improvement? What, what Does it sound good to me? Otherwise we are in this process of chasing after something and we're not sure what it is that we're chasing after. So yeah. it's just more of a thumbs up for, for Norm's work. Thank, okay. thank you very much, Steve. And, you know, I would say that, you know, any system, regardless of cost, will benefit from the EVP. So, and again, as I mentioned in the presentation, they will address every sonic attribute. So in my, you know, decades of, of experience, that's the biggest bang for the buck. Isolate your speakers. Gary, you are the guy that we screwed by lowering <laughs> your hand. So go ahead. Sorry about that. All right, thank you. Uh, the room that you see behind me here is like 21 wide by 35 long. Nice. And I kind of built the home around this room when I moved to Florida. I thought I was big stuff when I had them put four 20 amp lines in to the uh, electronics room, which is adjacent to this room. But that's all I do to do. Uh, it, they're just ordinary 20 amp lines with no fancy ground resistance, 25 ohms to five ohms. I don't know what that's all about. How do you measure that? And who should I call? <laughs> um, well, so what you've done is you've got a, you've got some dedicated circuits uh, going to the room, but they are, they are not isolated from your panel nor from the, the grid. Um, yeah. nor are they, you know, maybe high quality or, or is heavy gauge and the right configuration, the right wire, in other words, the right insulation and, and all of that. So you've done like the minimum step and it's a step. That's, that's a good thing. I, I would suggest Gary, that, um, the next thing that you look at and the next affordable thing that you could do anyway, is look at the, the ground impedance impedance. And what we're talking about is measuring the ground, the, the grounding electrode. In other words, the conductor that the grounding electrode conductor that is connected to the um, the rod, the grounding rod, and your um, bus going to your panel. Um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I can do it, but probably it, it will take some effort on your part to find a local electrician that has the means of of measuring that. It, it doesn't seem to be very common. But um, that's what I would pursue first is see if you can get that measurement. And um, again, I'm happy to help you in any way I can. And then once you find that measurement, the next thing that you look at, Gary, is, OK, so what kind of soil is Gary on? <laughs> what might we need to do? And um, I can tell you at, at minimum, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, a, what they call a, a technical ground uh, rod system, and that is we're going to put, uh, um, we're going to wrap it with Benedite and um, so that it, it, it does a better job of conducting 
the rod to the earth for a, a much longer period of time. So anyway, that's it, that's a pretty that's something that most anyone can benefit from pretty affordably. Uh, it's, a, it's another one that I, I recommend. It's it's like the first thing that I would do as far as stepping up your electrical. Easy and, and significant. I have an electrician friend that I work with, and I just didn't know what to ask him if he could do. So ask, ask him, him if he has a a, gla a a a clamp that he can measure the um, the grounding electrode conductor. Okay. And I have a hum and buzz problem. Are there band-aids for that? N I don't like band-aids. No, you want to you want to fix what the problem is. You want to find out what what's causing that. There shouldn't be any. So yeah, you want to find out what that is. You don't want to filter it out. You want to eliminate it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I there are a few people oh. in the chat that don't have hands um, that uh, have been waiting over there patiently for me to call on them. So um, before I get to uh, Bob Federer's second question, I want to get to a couple of people in the chat. Uh, Jeff, Kalina, you have like a bunch of questions. Do you, do you think you can narrow it down to, uh, to one or two? Yeah, I'll just pick one of these things. Uh, by the way, thank you for that presentation. That was really uh, insightful. I think the one that I'm going to go with is my first one. I have a balanced power transformer that I'm using. It wasn't super expensive. I bought it, I think it was 600 bucks. Might have cost to have that much to ship it. <laughs> so what's your feeling on these? I mean, I, I've heard bad things about conditioners in general, but I thought maybe this type was safe. Um, who makes this balanced? It's made by a guy who's, uh, I think he's dying. He's, he's <laughs> closed his company down. I think I, I think it was in the Midwest. He was a friend of a friend. Oh, okay, so nothing that I would know about. Probably not unless you've been in the following these things for the last 20 years, which you probably have been. I have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, I wish I could tell you the name of the guy, but I don't have it handy. Okay. But it has a 60-pound transformer. Yeah, BPT, Balanced Power Transformer. Their products are still around. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, but in general, I am a fan of balanced transformers. Um, so, you know, and again, you know, beyond that, I, I have no idea what you're, you're dealing with. Sure. So, yeah. It's something about balancing the, the charge on each pole. Something. Right. I'm not yeah. very technically oriented, so I have no idea, but that. Well, you that probably the... understand um, XLR cables, right? Those are balanced. Yeah. So it's kind of the same application, same idea. Um, I, I'm a fan of, you know, there's a couple of brands that we handle, Equitech and Taurus. Both of those are, are balanced audio transformers. In particular, those are, and like I, said, I imagine yours is, they're specifically designed for audio equipment. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's mine. Mine is designed that way. So you're saying I don't need to be worried about, well, you're not saying really... You don't know what I have, but no, <laughs> okay. no, yeah. I don't know what you have, nor do I know your um, power conditions, you know, your power quality at all. But I'd say um, you're, you're on the right track. You know, uh, you can't do any harm with, uh, with that, whether it's addressing a particular issue that you have, I have no idea. Yeah. Well, I think I have pretty good power because I'm near a transformer and I have two 20 amp uh, dedicated lines coming in here. Let me ask you a quick question. Do you ever take your stereo outside and listen to it and then compare it inside to outside? No. No. But I have done I have done what you're talking about, but I would not be able to do that very easily with my system. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a little difficult. I, I rolled my speakers out, but uh, the difference in the sound quality just it more than doubled. And I have a fairly decent sounding room, or so I've been told. Uh, but going outside was like a whole new world. It was amazing. Well, so if, if, that's, if, if that's the case, Jeff, I'm thinking that you probably could do some more work on the acoustics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jeff. I want to move on to the other people. I'm, before I get to the, the raised hands, just one other thing. I see that Tracy Sakai asked about the PS Audio Power Plant. 
Doug Coffey asked about the AudioQuest Niagara power conditioner. I know Arnie Balgalvis um, compared them and actually wrote a wrote a review. I think it came out, Arnie, if uh, if I remember, that you kind of liked the uh, um, the AudioQuest slightly better, but you both thought they improved your system. So, um, Norman, what do you think about those? those kind of things. Um, uh, you know, I use a, 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 a hospital grade isolation transformer just on my like digital sources and computer. Well, what I was mentioning before is, you know, there's a difference between um, an isolation transformer and, and a power conditioner. Power conditioners are going to be addressing uh, many, they will possibly be addressing many different issues in different ways and at different levels. And so when you compare one in this environment that may need these, you know, meet these conditions, but not the others, or this environment over here, it's, it's, it's a hodgepodge, it's really hard. Um, a good quality isolation transformer, that's going to give you a good clean break from um, the grid. And, you know, so, so now you've got a good clean energy source. And hopefully you won't need to do um, any other conditioning. If so, then it's probably at the fault of a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. But my, my thing is, is that we, we, those conditioners can be great. They can also be bad. You know, if we're applying one to something we shouldn't, then it's going to have some negative um, qualities to it. Mm -hmm. So that's again, why I say it's important to understand, you know, you need to, you need to measure the equipment and um, and apply a proper solution. Uh, Gary, I, Gary Reber, I don't think you've yeah. asked the question yet. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I can highly recommend Norm. Uh, <laughs> we worked together many years on two widescreen review reference systems. Yep. yep. And, <laughs> and the, the biggest improvements that I have found is in the balanced power transformers. It's just night and day. I've used uh, the Equitech wall system, which is a big wall system, fully 20 amp system. Yeah, and it's currently, about, about 400 pounds. Yeah, right. And currently uh, in my living room system, I'm using the Equitech uh, five, what is it, five? I credited in the magazine something. It's a <laughs> five, five Q. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it works fantastic. And that's an affordable power condition that I recommend to everybody. And definitely plug your power amplifiers into it also. Yeah. You, you won't hear anything. I can't hear anything. I can have my system on and I can walk up to my, my big magnifiers. I don't know if they're on. You cannot hear anything. It's just uh -huh. noise free and it's it's just fantastic. Yeah. So but Norm does a great job on all this stuff. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Gary. And uh, one uh, one thing that came up about the uh, the question about the uh, ground. Um, do you think you could um, send me uh, or put in the chat at some point the specific questions to ask an electrician, so, um, like in terms of what they need to know and what they can do. Yeah, I could. Now, in the slide presentation, I, I hit on that pretty well. When I go out okay. and do an on-site survey of um, uh, the electrical, there's 20-something, maybe maybe like 30 measurements that I take. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a few, but there's some basic things that I think, again, you know, the, the average electrician, just like, you know, the average acoustician, may not have the understanding or the equipment to take the measurements that are that are important. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they can take some basic measurements, but um, maybe not the ones that, that we really need. Uh, but anyway, you can I'll send you that and and um, and you know there are electricians out there that can. You just gotta do a little sleuthing. Okay. All right. Um, let's see somebody else who hasn't asked yet, uh, JR Boys, Claire. Hey, Jr. Hello. Good to Hello. see you. Hi, good to see you, by the way. <laughs> good, good to see you all. 
Um, and I just want I wanted to put a quick plug in for Norman. He is, I, I've certainly learned a lot from him and we're really kindred spirits in that we both are fully aware that there are some things that can be measured and should be measured in order to get the basics right. And, um, he and I shared a, uh, a trade show, uh, booth together. We're going to do it again in Seattle. And, uh, I just enjoy being, um, just picking this fella's mind. I've learned a great deal from him and, um, he's not one of the, he's, he's not one of those guys. If he doesn't know, he'll say so. And he's not, uh, Beware of people who know everything um, <laughs> in this in this hobby. I mean, if uh, the people who really know a lot are learning so quickly, in my opinion, that they only are realizing how much more there is to learn. That's, so yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I can. So more of a comment than a question, but I I just want to say, um, uh, Norman, I I like I love what you do and uh, certainly support it. Well, back at you, Jr. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, Norman, uh, can we expect to see you at the uh, Capital Audio Fest this year? A lot of yeah, a lot yeah. of people on the East Coast go to that. Yeah, I'll be there. Um, and as Jr. just mentioned, we're going to be at the the uh, Pacific Audio Fest uh, later this month, next week, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Norm, great presentation. I got to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, will so, I thanks, see you guys. at Cedia, Gary? No, I'm not going to CBS. Really. Okay. All right. Well, I, yeah. I will be there if anybody else is going to be there. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's good. See you, Gary. Hey, thanks so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Gary. Um, now we'll get back to repeat uh, questioners. Bob Finner, and go ahead. Great presentation, as I said before. Have you ever had to address a room that had a grand piano in it? Huh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, two things that pop up to mind. Um, yes, absolutely, I have. The The first thing that I would do is um, lay a blanket over the, the strings. And then the Perfect. second thing, that, that'll help from your point of view of listening to music and not causing it to, to excite and play into the room. Um, and then the, the other thing is from a performer's point of view, put EVPs under the legs. We have done this numerous times and uh, professional pianists have then said, not only does it sound better, um, much more harmonic um, content, but these uh, two of these guys have said, I can feel it. It feels better, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, we've, we've been getting that kind of feedback. I, um, I first, I play drums and the first time I discovered it was under my floor tom tom. I, I tried it out and oh my gosh, you know, my floor Tom Tom has so much more sound. Yeah, so much I didn't, more. I didn't hear what you said. Uh, uh, under my, under my floor Tom Tom legs, I put EVPs and oh. now the floor Tom Tom sounds so much fuller and richer. Um, then uh, uh, Michael Bishop, you know, the recording engineer who passed away um, last year for, you know, Telarc and so forth. He puts EVPs under his microphone stand and he called me during a session. He was recording a cellist and I said, he called during a break and I said, do me a favor and try putting an EVP under the end peg, you know, the, um, that connects the, the cello to the floor. And, uh, he called back and he said, I wish we had done the whole session that way. Yeah. It's it, again, it, it just allowed the sound to be more harmonic content. Yeah. I don't have the strength to lift the legs of the piano to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what is it's an EVP? It's not a one-man job. What's an EVP? What are you talking about? Equipment vibration protectors. So a grand piano, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, depends, you know, 700, 900 pounds. So we make custom EVPs for such things. So we've got, you know, three four-inch EVPs one under each leg that can handle that kind of weight and isolate it now from the structure. So now the structure doesn't also reflect back. Same with the speaker. Not It's a two-way street. Vibrations are always a, a two-way street. So um, it not only prevents it from, from uh, transmitting into the structure and exciting it, but from that excited structure reflecting back to the soundboard. 
So do you have an EVP under your computer right now for a better sound uh, to the microphone? Under my little tiny <laughs> subwoofer, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. you do? Okay. I do. I do. And that's mainly for um, uh, noise control so it doesn't annoy others. Okay. All right. So I won't ask you to do an A, an A B test of removing the EVPs and seeing what. what right. Happens. Right. Okay. Never mind. Um, Arnie, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. I, I just want to mention that uh, the the presentation has been fabulous. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I appreciate to be able to participate. My, Thanks, Arnie. Uh, um, my question is about your system. Would you care to elaborate what the system is? Sure. And then yeah, the second yeah. thing is I have Salon, the Revel Salon, two speakers. And they, I, the way I sit right now, I am slightly below the tweeter, you know, uh, axis. Uh, if I were to ray, use the EVPs, then that would raise the speaker. And by how much would it be raised? Yeah, you're correct, Arnie. And, and it would raise about an inch or so. Um, uh, you know, it depends on, on the amount of compression. Normally the EVPs are, are gonna compress about 30%, 10 to 30%. Um, and you're right, the elevation, it, depending on many other variables and, and of course the particular speaker, but the elevation will change and that can change the sound attributes too. And therefore, you might even consider um, raising your listening chair if need be. Yeah, well, if it's an inch, I can raise the listening chair easily. Yeah. So yeah. what about your system? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a room within a room. It's a dedicated space. All the floors, the ceiling, um, walls, they're all independent. They're all isolated from one another structurally. They're made, we use our, you know, all of our products in it, constrained layer damping, um, uh, our frequency response panel system, um, the, the dimensions, everything are the best that they could be given the, the physical constraints of the, uh, of the space as far as a room mode distribution point of view. Um, so from a noise control point of view and a room mode point of view, it's, um, it's you know, optimal. Um, this, this, the electronics itself, I have what they call, um, they, this company doesn't exist anymore. They're booth audio speakers and I have um, their aperiodic loaded transmission lines. I have the same speaker um, right and left, front and back. So I have a 5.1 system. And then I've got a pair of compound loaded subwoofers. And then the center channel is an exact match of the other main speakers minus the woofer. Um, I'm dual mono biamping, um, all MIT uh, interconnected for the most part. Um, uh, their Coda technology, uh, same amplifier driving all of the speakers. Speaker lengths and interconnect are all the same. Um, electro, uh, I have a dedicated, you know, SDS, and um, and again, those dedicated circuits are the same lengths. Um, uh, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm into analog and, and digital, so I stream and I've got over 5,000 LPs. Um, um, uh, that's what, anything else you want to know in particular? Thank you. That's, that's okay. educational. <laughs> Norm, I have a couple of questions, a real quick one. What, what type of music do you most like to listen to? Mm, I totally go in, in moods. So sometimes it's blues or jazz or classical or classic rock. Um, yeah, so it, I, I listen to anything but rap. <laughs> this one's a little bit longer. We, we've been, people have been asking you about their specific systems and I wanted to ask you some generic questions about uh, acoustical treatments or, or whatnot in uh, rooms. So I was going to throw a few things at you and you can either say yes or no, or, or, or give a quick explanation. Uh, okay. A lot of people have a TV between their speakers. Uh, do you recommend they cover that when they want to do critical listening? Yeah, that's a, a good idea because you do have um, uh, a reflection point there. Uh, again, it depends on the, the size of the screen, but you know, every speaker 
as a, a source and it's going to have six, you know, we've got six um, surfaces in our, our room uh, at minimum that each of those speakers is going to have um, six first order reflection points. And so like I was talking about earlier, one of the first things that you, you'll do in uh, controlling the, the uh, propagation of sound in a room is to address those first order reflection points. And you would do that with either absorption or diffusion, depending again on, on what you need. Sometimes you've got a room that is already um, uh, very absorbent, and so you don't want to introduce more. And so you would put a diffuser at a first order reflection. Now you're um, you're scattering how you're you're eliminating that specular reflection, that interference to you. And, uh, um, and yet not introducing more absorption into the environment. What if you have large uh, you know, picture windows in, in your listening room? How will you handle that? Really uh, problematic, but from several points of view, one, they're gonna resonate, two, they're escape routes for low frequencies. That can be a plus, that can help as far as room modes. It can also mean that um, it's not gonna, gonna contain the energy, it's going to escape. And then obviously you've got a reflection point. Now the easiest way to address a window from a reflection point of view is, is with a curtain. A lot of people have a coffee table between where they're sitting and where their system is. Bad idea. So, <laughs> Thank you, you for that. Critical move it. <laughs> yeah. want to listen. Oh, well, when you're critically listening, you know, just move it out of the, out of the way. But yeah, you, um, and again, you know, I'll, I'll see this at reviewers' homes quite often and, and remark about it. You know, you've got a, that's quite a reflection that's interfering with your, um, with your evaluation. And uh, so I, I recommend putting something on it or, or, you know, that's going to absorb that reflection or moving it aside so that it's out of the way of that a first or maybe even a second order reflection. Because, yeah, that, that's going to, that can be a big interfering factor. It's definitely audible. If you have doors or multiple doors, keep them open or closed. Um, well, again, if you, you know, most doors are just hollow and don't really do anything. The low frequencies don't really see them anyway. But if they're solid, they, they are going to contain some of that energy. Um, by opening them, then that's going to relieve room modes. But again, at the same time, that might, you might relieve some of the visceral impact that maybe you're after, which means you got to turn up the volume if you want to enjoy that again. So yeah, it depends. You can take measurements though and find out, is this a, you know, is this a, um, is it um, removing the cue of those room modes beneficially to me? And, and most likely it is. Again, we're talking small rooms. So to open up a door, it's going to, you know, be a noise control issue for other people, but it will smooth out the, the room modes. And so most of the time, I would say that is going to be a benefit from a room mode point of view. It also means that that opening now is absorption. So it, it again, depending on your situation, that can be a plus or a minus. But uh, if you open up a window, that's 100% absorption. Okay, a couple more and I'll, I'll be done with this. Uh, Carpeting, hardwood, or concrete floors, good, bad, or otherwise? Uh, How would you rate them? They're different, but regardless of the floor, you've got a first order reflection point that you want to address. Yeah. Okay. And that was actually my, my last question. How, how do you know where your first order reflection point is in your room? How, how, do, you, how do you figure out where to put the absorber or the diffuser to, right. to know uh, where that point is? That's a, a real easy one, but it does take two people. You, you need an assistant and you need a flat hand mirror. And so you're going to be, it's, it's just a matter of geometry. I mean, you could also do it mathematically, but uh, the easiest thing and the 100% and confirmation is you're at the listening position and you have your assistant go to each of the six surfaces. So this means getting on a ladder for the, the, uh, the ceiling as well and locating the tweeter. When you see the tweeter in, in the, um, um, centered in the mirror, then, excuse me, then take a piece of masking tape and mark it. That's your first order reflection on that surface for that speaker. 
Is, is it normally a, a, at the speaker level height or ceiling level height or? Tweeter, you're looking for the, the tweeter. So we're really trying to address the, the high frequencies for sure and the, the low ones. The higher the frequency, the more directional. So really what we wanna try and nail on a specular reflection point of view is, is the tweeter in the mid range. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Uh, I will get back to some raised hand people. It looks like Gary is uh, next up. Please unmute yourself, Gary. We've talked about a lot of uh, electrical uh, items such as the ground rod system, balance power transformers, uh, uh, I, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could publish a, a picture, a circuit diagram of an audio room with all of these components uh, leading into it, where they are and what they're called? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. Um, and, uh, you know, I, all of the stuff that we've covered throughout the, um, the years, you know, I, if you aren't already, then, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel and, and, um, and look at the articles on, on the website. There's a ton of stuff there. Um, but you're right. And I still do. As things come up in conversation, I create new diagrams or whatever. Specifically, um, you know, everyone's got a different situation. And, and so that's why they hire me. But in general, um, I can do what you have described. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll look at doing that again. Uh, if, but if you were to look at some of the articles or and I, you know, I can't think of a specific many posts that I've done on, um, on Facebook, on, on my Facebook, um, I've, I've hit electrical a lot. Um, not very recently, but, um, this year. Okay. I'll look at the website. Thank you. Okay. Alan Edelstein, go ahead. Edelstein. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure which one's correct. German would be Edelstein. <laughs> right, right. I want to. I want to get it right, Mr. Edelstein. Go ahead. Uh, we've talked about isolation of vibration of mechanical devices and putting isolation devices under them. But how about putting isolation devices under electronic equipment to isolate it because of the effect on microphonics? And I ask this because I played with it and heard changes in electronics that sound like I bought a product from a completely different company sometimes. Yeah, well, I, uh, of course, we recommend that. Um, there is, again, a priority to do it. So if you're interested in isolation, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the biggest bang for the buck is to address the source of vibration first. So your subwoofer, your loudspeakers, isolate those. That's going to give you the biggest bang that's gonna quiet the room. That has a huge impact sonically. Next, address the more sensitive electronics first. That would be a turntable, um, a CD player, a DAC, anything with a digital clock in it with a quartz crystal is sensitive to vibrations, anything with tubes, because they're microphonic, cables and so forth. And the way I would do that is, you know, if you can't in your mind, already know in my particular system, the most sensitive piece of equipment is this, then I start with the source and work my way down. Because anything down, down here is gonna benefit from what's being addressed up here. So I've isolated a lot of my electronics, but not my speakers. And what you're saying yeah. is I'm, I'm fixing a problem caused by something else, right? Uh, now. Well, <laughs> yes and no. But um, you're you are missing the the biggest bang for the buck. Okay. Yeah. That's Thank speakers you. source of vibration. That's the first thing that I recommend. Uh, let me just ask you a question. When you're dealing with uh, small speakers that are on stands, how do you do you recommend isolating at the bottom of the stand or? Yeah, that's a great question. question. Yeah, the, the best thing to do, and you can't always do it this way, but th th ideally it would be between the speaker cabinet and the stand shelf. Um, that way, any vibrations from the speaker cabinet will not transfer to the, the stand, which is going to resonate, and to the floor, which is going to resonate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then back, you know, in, in reverse. So, um, 
that's the best place to put it in the system is, is again, you're, you're, you want to isolate it at the source. All right, Arnie, go ahead. I have a question about the power line quality from place to place. In my review, I've made a big point about it that just for example, the power line conditions at my house, I'm willing to bet anything are completely different than the power line conditions. Now, even before correction, I mean, yeah. than they are at your place. Yeah. So it's like listening rooms. There are no two, two listening rooms that are the same. And I would say no to So, you know, that's important. But what I also was asking about sort of sarcastically in the industry, that is there a, in the industry, is there a device that can be used to analyze the condition of a power, a power line and then therefore, you know, take some measures to try to correct that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, to comment on, you know, everybody's power supply, you're right. Everybody, and it varies from not only place to place, but from time to time. So sound quality is, is a, uh, unless you've got it under control again, like with a separately derived system, um, uh, it, it's going to vary. And um, just like acoustic, so you do need to measure, you need to investigate and find out what the problems are and address them properly while not addressing other things that should be left alone. Um, uh, let's see, the, the second part of your, your question was what? Measurement. Oh yeah, so there's, you know, just like anything, there's, there's several different devices. The, the Fluke 43B is, um, is my main device, but that's limited. It's not gonna tell me, um, it's not gonna measure common and, and um, normal mode distortion. It's not going to uh, measure um, ground, in, well, it'll, it'll measure impedance, but not ground electrode in, impedance. Um, so yeah, I mean, like anything, there's, there's gonna be several devices that are going to be needed to do a full investigation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris Har, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, quick question: Looking at the uh, product page for your ADP pla or EDP platforms. Sorry about that. Uh, with these, these are prices for pairs. Is that accurate? No, those are individual. So all the EVPs are individual. Okay. Now with the the C, the EVP platforms, you need one pair. Um, so you would run a pair under your amplifier or speaker, um, either running on each side front to back or on the front and back side to side. Where with the, the regular EVPs, you need one, um, you need at least three setting up a, a tripod uh, setup or one under each foot, four, or there are times where you need five to handle the load. Sometimes buying five two inch EVPs are gonna be cheaper than buying four, four inch and will accommodate the load. It's all about, uh, about handling the load properly. Yeah, I understand that. Overload it or underload it. Because the amount of compression affects the acoustic exactly. property of the, of the damping material. Okay, exactly. so for example, I've got Focal Scala Evos. They're about 190 pounds a piece or so, right? Yeah. yeah. And so given that they're relatively, uh, uh, narrow but also long platform. Mm -hmm. They're on casters, but they also have spikes. So probably in your solution, you're going to spike the speaker on top of one of your platforms in order to prevent it from moving around. Is that uh, correct? Or well, so the the more affordable would be to put a platform in the front and back, going side to side, because that's going to be a smaller platform and more affordable. If you can. Um, if you can eliminate the spikes, I do. For one, we are we talked about elevation earlier as an issue. And secondly, you just, again, you wanna remove anything in the system that doesn't need to be there that could contribute. Not that the EVPs care about what's above or what's below them, but just understanding that the cabinet's gonna cause the spike to, to resonate. Now that mm -hmm. won't be transferred down to the structure, down to the floor, but it will be reflected back to the cabinet. And so that's not a good thing. So I recommend removing it if you can. And if you cannot, as in some instances, then you just use it. Um, and we supply these little uh, like coins. So, so to protect the surface of the, uh, the surface 
of the EVP. Sure. Speakers came with that. I'm not sure if the casters are removable, to be perfectly honest. They're, they're there to allow you to remove them from the boxes and to position them before you, you come up with yeah. a final solution. So uh, right. it, you might, I might be stuck in that regard. It, I noticed that you have different, different cover materials. Are any of these particularly slick or not in terms of? Yeah, yeah so we, we offer typically two, felt or rubber. Uh, felt works well if you, like for example, a, a preamp on a smooth surface, if you want to, you know, if you're often getting to the back of it, then a felt EVP is going to slide pretty easily, where rubber is not going to move at all. And so you might use want rubber under a speaker, for example, that you don't want to move. Um, the performance is exactly the same between the two. The other difference be between movement is, um, is height. The, the rubber is going to be the top and bottom is going to add a half inch in height. Thank you. Okay. I won't take up more of your time on that. Right. I can ask you other questions offline if it's necessary. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I promised Sam Arar that he would uh, go next um, because he's he couldn't find the, uh, the raise hand gesture. I just wanted to make one quick comment and then I'll call on Sam. Um, I guess a lot of us were um, uh, resistant to the idea of putting isolation devices under speakers because we thought the stability of the loudspeaker was more important than the isolation. And um, I, I take it that's not true. You know, this could be, I mean, this is a deep conversation. Um, and I, I, I mean, this is what I, I love this. Um, but just the short answer is, if that speaker cabinet is made of cast concrete, and I've got a pair of old round of tears from Sweden. Oh, cool. Are. Yeah, I love those. Yeah. yeah. Um, concrete moves. Um, some manufacturers even design their cabinets to move as part of the Sonics. Um, the EVPs are not going to change that. The cabinet's still going to move. All the EVP do is doing is eliminating the transfer of vibration. Um, uh, what was I going to say when you uh, the first part of your? Uh, well, the you know the the tiptoes or spikes or whatever provides stability. Oh, yeah. And um, the the idea that the speaker can move slightly freaks us out. Yeah. Well, now the EVPs are are mainly they're they're layers of fiberglass. Okay, and they work like leaf springs. And this is, you know, as far as six degrees of freedom, this is mainly up and down, okay? So via transmission to and from the, the resting platform. But the significance, again, from a sonic point of view of isolation or rather decoupling versus coupling is huge. And again, as I say, that cabinet is still gonna move. The right. EVPs aren't gonna stop that nor does the manufacturer maybe even want it to. Um, so yeah, uh, it's one of those myths that is uh, uh, misunderstood in, in, um, in the audiophile industry and uh, I but, want to put but, a stop to it. Yeah, per, but persistent, but we'll try to stop. Ho hopefully this, is, we're doing our little part to stop it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Sam Arar, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Well, thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. I learned a lot. I'm a do-it-yourselfer guy. I build my own speakers. I build the Wilson XVS with a separate com compartment, if you will. So I use time alignment to align my, my uh, stage, if you will. However, I have one problem. You mentioned earlier about, about maybe 70 hertz that uh, the, the, the room with the speakers, I guess. And I cheated there. Instead of building a filter for it, I end up using an equalizer. Your thought on that? Um, well, uh, that's great, Sam. I mean, that's you, you did uh, what you, that's, but it's a band aid. Uh, so, in other words, it's not going to eliminate the issue. And there are other issues too. Just because we've got a, a particular peak, typically at 70 hertz, uh, you know, who knows what the Q is, who knows where the other resonances are, and your structure is different from mine, and it's going to be multiple connections and cavities and, and materials that make up multiple resonances. 
So I just use one example that is typical and pretty strong, but um, yeah, to isolate would be the better solution to eliminate the structure from playing back altogether, not only from resonance, but from buzzes and, and rattles as well. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we'll uh, go back to the raised hands for now. Uh, George, go ahead. Great, okay, so how, what's the best way to isolate a turntable? In my particular instance, I have a, a George Merrill poly table that has isolation feats, part of his system. Um, but to even to, to, to increase isolation, should I use like, in, you had mentioned platforms or just another individual footer under his feet? What would you recommend? Um, it, am I wrong or is the, uh, the motor a separate entity? The motor is separate. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is, and I've, I've got a well-tempered table. I know Mark does too. And so yep. we've got that situation. And, and so the, the way I addressed that was I had a, a custom piece of granite made the, the size of the, the table. And uh, I ended up doing some modifications to it too, because even the solid granite still has some ringing. So I, I added a constrained layer damping material to it. Um, and that way now I've got, I, I can put both pieces. I don't have to isolate them independently, which is tough to do and, and get it balanced well. And I've got five two inch EVPs under that platform. So that's, that's the way I addressed it. But this raises an interesting question. I still see turntables that come out with like tiptoe style feet on the assumption that these feet are mechanical diodes. We, I, you know, like I've been reading about tiptoes being mechanical diodes for three decades. Um, what's wrong with that idea? Well, I, you know, and, and uh, when Steve McCormick came out with tiptoes back in the, what was it, early 80s or mid 80s, and, and I was a dealer, um, you know, Steve didn't know what was going on. He just knew that it sounded different. And as again, um, I explained earlier, we are often fooled into thinking that if it's louder, it's better. Um, but again, it's going to be different in every single situation. So if I change the material or I change its shape or size, or the resting platform or the load on it, those are all variables that are gonna alter the end result. With the, the EVPs, you're, you're not coupling, you are decoupling, you're isolating, and you are isolating from five Hertz on up, 90% conservatively. The resonance that what they call the natural frequency of the EVP is 3.4 Hertz under proper load. And they are effective right away from five Hertz on up. And again, you know, you can see the, the, uh, the transmissibility lab results. They are effective from five Hertz on up. So even like a turntable on a, um, a surface area, we get this a lot. You've got a, a customer that says, I've got feedback with my subwoofer and my turntable. Or when I walk across the room, uh, it causes mistracking or I can hear it or whatever. Um, that's typically around seven Hertz. Um, with the EVPs, it, it eliminates it. Where you're coupling, you're just altering the sound and you are not isolating, you are coupling. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna sound different. And uh, granted, you may like the sound, but it's not neutral and it's not predictable. It's not natural and it's not repeatable. And I uh, think what's a tiptoe? Sorry to... Um, Tiptoes were a, um, an aluminum cone that uh, Steve McCormick came out with uh, as a, an accessory, uh, an audio accessory back in the 80s. And he made two. One was pretty long and the other one was pretty short. Is it like an upside down pyramid shape or? But, but cylindrical. It, right. They were, and they were in the 80s and 90s ubiquitous. I mean, yeah. every, everywhere. Uh, everybody used them. I, I've, I've got in my closet like probably 20 or 30 of, of the two yeah. sizes. So, uh, and, you know, I, I, I love Steve. Um, but uh, yeah, I got to say that uh, it, um, now I'm uh, competing against the idea of coupling versus decoupling. Right. The other thing with a turntable, of course, um, 
where you have a motor producing vibrations and um, even the the stylus itself vibrating the record, which goes into the platter, which goes into the bearing. And there is this thought that you've got to get those vibrations out of the system. You don't want them reflecting back. And thus the the mechanical diode, the idea was that those vibrations go out of the turntable yeah. and don't come back because of that sharp little point. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> absolutely wrong. Right. Um, remember, vibration is a two-way street. And again, now where this idea came up with, I haven't a clue, but it's there is no confusion in, in other industries about this. This is basic physics. Um, there is a, uh, on, if you go to the avroomservice.com um, EVP landing page and you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you will see, I, I went to a, a customer's house and uh, um, I was there doing room acoustics and um, helping them out with room acoustics. And I noticed that he had a half a dozen different types of footers around. And so I asked him, hey, can I do a, a quick little, would you videotape me doing a quick little demonstration with a, a music box? Now, the music box has these, this is what I do at, at the trade shows too in, in person. It's sometimes very hard to do because the, the noise floor is so high. But um, the, the tines on the music box are moving plus or minus one millimeter, okay? Not very much. And they are going from about 500 hertz on up. We're talking about a very, very small amount of energy. Not like what we are talking about when we are, when we are, we are coupling a loudspeaker to um, a, a surface area. Now, I take that, that music box. It's just the music box mechanism. No box, no resonator, no sounding board, and I play it in the ear, in the air, and you can't, you can hear it, but it's hard to hear. And then I couple it to the the table, and it is 27 dB louder. It's very easy to hear. And then I, I, when I asked him this, he goes, "Oh, I've got more than that." He had, I don't know, like 10 or 11 different kinds of footers out there, and um, so I just lined them up and put them in between the, I placed the music box mechanism on top of the device under test with the um, table underneath. And you can hear, and I, I think I'm gonna put together a montage of them side by side. Here, I've got a little break in between. You can hear, they all sound different. And then I do the EVP at the end and it's actually quieter than it is in the air. You talked about solid granite underneath the table. Uh... I and other people will use like a hardwood, typically a maple butcher block, et cetera, uh, as their support underneath the table. Uh, any feelings on that versus granite? Well, granite is just a little bit more inert. It's a, you know, more mass, um, doesn't tend to have as the resonances that, that other materials, even other types of, uh, of um, rock do. So that's why, but then, like I say, it, even it, that slab, rings and it weighs like 95 pounds um so i i've got a, a material on the bottom of that to to help with the the ringing of it hmm. interesting okay uh edgar leonard you've been very patient sorry to hold you up uh go ahead and unmute and ask your question thank you very much and i've enjoyed the entire conversation and uh the questions uh, much appreciated uh, Norm, my question is uh, about my speakers, and if this is better taken in a separate call, let me know. Uh, I've got NOLA uh, Concert Baby Grands. Do you know them? I don't. The, but Carl, uh, who makes these speakers, has a very interesting concept in that he has a platform underneath the speaker that has ball bearings. Um, and... I'm interested in trying your devices. I guess the question is, is, is what he had was spikes originally and now I have still points. Would it be better in your opinion? I mean, I could try both of these ways, but uh, any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, those are, those are coupling devices, not decoupling devices. So they will transfer vibrations uniquely and very efficiently. So um, yeah, not what I recommend. 
there on this video that I was telling you about at the bottom of the EVP landing page, it's just a short video. You'll, you'll see similar devices and you'll hear what they do just with a tiny amount of, I mean, we're talking about tweeter energy. We're not talking about big low frequency energies. And yet listen to how they amplify and, and are unique and, and color the sound. And again, the resting, the, the resting platform, your room, your structure, the materials and methods will all be unique. And so it will again be different. And if you, you know, let's say you like that sound and now you put it on a, in a different room or a different whatever, it's gonna be different. Not the case with the EVPs. Got it. Thanks everybody. I appreciate you letting me ask the question. We'll move on to Richard Atkinson. Can you have too much isolation? I have my turntable with ISO uh, acoustic uh, feed on top of a maple. Oh. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, but like I say, it, it has to be complete isolation. Once you've got complete isolation, you have complete isolation. If you add more isolation, it's not going to change. Thank it's either you. you got it or you don't. Uh, now, I need to qualify that. There are, there's, I did say complete, didn't I? So there's various forms in between of, you know, even uh, these, you know, couplers, like I show on the graph, there are some areas where they do attenuate the sound, but then there's also resonances where they amplify the sound. So anytime you're talking about a coupler rather than a, a pure, true isolator, um, you're just changing, you're just filtering, you're just altering the sound and, and not really isolating it correctly. Arnie, did you have a question or did you want to just, uh, were you? No, it's been commonly experienced by many people that listening at 5 p.m. or, you know, around dinner time or even in the afternoon uh, to the system sounds completely different than what you can hear at 11, 12, one o'clock in the night at night. Yeah. Uh, the theory being that, you know, a lot of stuff gets turned off. A lot of PCs get turned off. People are not using their cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, dishwashers are not likely to be going at that time. It's again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can that be used as a, shall we say, an estimate of how bad your power line is contributing to your sound, how badly it's contributing to, sight, to your sound. Uh, because in some areas, I'm sure that you can listen at 5 p.m. Uh, or 11 a, or uh, you know, 11 p.m. and the sound is likely to be the same unless something is coming you know, in, into your system on your own you know, level with your own dishwasher. Or whatever. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Arnie. And um, uh, I live at, at, in, you know, uh, far from the city. And so cleaner power than if I lived in the city where, you know, um, a lot is, is put on the, on the, the grid and power factor correction is, is a lot of what you're talking about. Not only the internal computers and, you know, low level um, energies, but in the city, people will especially notice it sounds better at night when the the world, you know, the the grid around them is um, that they're connected to has quieted, and you know power, um, you know uh, power companies they work on changing power factor correction. We're talking about current and voltage phase being um, being off, and they they make constant adjustments regarding that. Um, but sometimes they do a good job, sometimes they don't. And again, depends on where you live and the conditions and, and so forth. But you're right, Arnie, that is real common to experience that the system sounds better at night because the electrical power supply is, is, is better. Please let me add some, uh, one comment that I have. The noise floor is also going down tremendously in the night. Mm -hmm. so, and you talked about it in the beginning. That is, for me, a, a tremendous part of these, that equation and that discussion. Background noise is yeah. going down tremendously in the night. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, definite point. Yes. Yep. Traffic and, and air, um, both in the air and, and on the ground. You're right. Again, where I live uh, and then a room inside of a room and all of that, I don't have that issue. But for example, if um, if I were watching a movie and it was an undersea, underwater movie and I heard an airplane interrupt, that would be disconcerting, you know, <laughs> or I was in space and, and I hear a, a car horn, a truck or something like that. It, it, it pulls you out of the experience. So yes, um, outside noise um, infiltration is a, to me, it's, it's really important because that those distractions remove you. And then it's very hard. It'll take you 20 or 30 minutes after a distraction to get back into the zone. Mark, can you, can you see that my hand is up? I do. I have a question. You, you didn't use the hand raise feature of Zoom, so I had no way of knowing that. I, my hand has been up for quite a while. Well, that doesn't count, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, uh, Ross, go ahead. Should I go now? Yeah, go now. This is a wonderful presentation. I'm really, uh, I'm really glad to have been here for this. Uh, my question is about the effect of uh, near field listening for speakers. Okay. Where the speakers are, uh, uh, and and the and the one listener. Uh, form a triangle at one end of a room and the music is heard not from the speakers, they drop out totally and the sound is a picture uh, uh, across the, uh, the width of the room uh, all the way at the uh, far end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How would uh, how would this sort of uh, speaker arrangement uh, affect uh, or determine uh, the uh, some some of the th things that you've been speaking about? Right. So um, what you're talking about, Ross, is called the critical listening distance, and what that is, and, and again, this is measurable. So. Um, near field would be within that distance, far field would be without. And what's going to, it is, what it is, is a ratio, well, actually the critical listening distance point is where the energy from the, um, the direct airborne loudspeaker arrives at the listener or the, the microphone and the sound energy that is reflected back from the room are equal. So if you're inside of that listening triangle, as, as you mentioned, then you begin to change that, that ratio and you begin to eliminate, you're hearing more of the direct sound, the direct airborne sound, and less of the, the room reflected sound. Now, what determines that obviously is distance between you and the, the source, as well as distance between you and the boundaries. But in addition to that, it's reverberation times. So if I've got a lot of hard reflections, then that sound is continuing on bouncing around for a longer period of time. And so that's more and more destructive and destructive and ruining low level detail and dynamic range and, and uh, articulation and, and everything really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, ideally you wanna be within that and you wanna control the, the first order reflections and the reverberation times so that um, you're hearing the direct sound rather than your room. So yeah, measurable, absolutely. In your case, the listener is not near any boundaries and the speakers aren't near, near any boundaries and you're listening in the near field. But um, yeah, right. So uh, Ron Nagel, go ahead. Okay, I, uh, you talked before about grounding your system. Yeah. And I live in an apartment building. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if uh, running a wire to my system power supply from a, a water pipe, like a radiator, would do anything at all. Uh, um, the other thing is, is computers a uh, desktop computers a significant source of noise, electrical noise? Okay. Well, Ron, it's 
it's hard to say, but in general, such uh, like an apartment like that, they're using um, the cold water pipes as uh, the ground and is sufficient, is usually very good. Uh, again, you know, you'd have to have it checked and, and, and see, but um, normally, uh, you know, commercial places like that are, are, are well grounded. He also asked you about a desktop computer contributing to line noise. You bet. You bet. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they can absolutely not only can they contribute, but they're also very sensitive. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Don, uh, try to keep the question short, but uh, okay. take it away. I'm, I'm ready. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, I live in a fairly small condo, um, eight foot ceiling in my listening room and about 200 square feet. Bookcase is full of 12 inch vinyl LPs. Would those, uh, I would assume those would tend to damper all the reflections and refractions and make it a little bit easier to get good sound in the room? Um, I mean, if you staggered them, uh, you might, you know, it might help a little bit. If you stagger them, you might introduce some diffusion as far as absorption or, or had cavities, you know, spaces in between or, or whatever, just like now books are going to be more of an absorber than vinyl. Vinyl is pretty dense, pretty, pretty solid. So it's going to act if you stagger them more as a diffuser than an absorber. And that can help with first order reflection points. Yes. Uh, another thing that, uh, um, that is effective is large leafed plants. They can be plastic. That that's a, a great thing to put at a first order reflection point, and it's incognito. Mm -hmm. And if you can see, um, the front edge of my speakers hang over the edge, over the front edge of a bookcase. I have a couple of bookcases that my speakers sit on, and the bookcases are about thirty six by thirty six and they're jammed full of LPs. So there's 300 or 400 pounds worth of dead weight and my speakers sit on top of those with the front edge of the speaker two or three inches in front of the bookshelf. Okay. So that would also be good, a good arrangement? Um, well, yes um, and no. <laughs> um, you're, you've introduced a lot of mass and, and that's good. Um, but you can't consider it as like an inertia block or something because you, you don't have any isolation in the system. It's, con it's a, a conductor. Okay. So yes, you've got mass. It's probably not resonating. It's probably pretty well damped, but it is transferring vibrations to the structure and back. Okay. One last really quick question. Where was the audio store that you used to own in California? Oh, that was in Grass Valley, Alta Buena Stereo. That's a uh, Sacramento area? Yeah, north of Sacramento. Um, you know where Nevada City is? Sort of. Okay, well, so it's right in the foot. If you're going up 80, it's right in the foothills on the way to Tahoe. Um, I had that for about 12 years. Oh, okay. I live, I live in the San Diego area now, and your speech, your presentation here has inspired me that I'm going to get in touch with my local dealer and have them come out and look at my room and take measurements. And before spending money on speakers, I'll spend money on room treatment. Excellent. I love to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thanks, cool. Don. Uh, Stephen Scharf, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, I don't have a question per se. I just want to um, give an enthusiastic recommendation for Norm's services. Um, Norm, we need to chat offline about some other things. Um, we haven't chatted in a while. Uh, what I will say uh, a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago, and I'm sure, Norm, you probably discussed your EVPs, um, your electronic vibration protectors to some extent. I'm really sorry. I just got this from Jeff like a little while ago. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I'll just relate very quickly a story that based on Norm's recommendation and expertise, um, I put a set of EVPs under my rail subwoofer, and it was one of the biggest improvements I've made ever to my system. And when I discussed it with Norm and I read um, uh, the theoretical underpinnings of why this works, basically it made the room quieter. That's the, the simplest thing I can say. Uh, but it, it took out a lot of resonance between the floor connect and the drywall, which resonates at 70 hertz, and made the room considerably quieter and really improved the presentation. So 
I want to give an enthusiastic thumbs up to Norm's EVPs. They really work. <laughs> they're not fancy looking, but they're grounded in established principles of physics, and they do the job. Um, uh, uh, other than that, um, with respect to grounding, I, I should probably contact you guys offline because I've been collaborating a lot with um, Shinyata on their soon-to-be-released grounding product and have learned a lot about the importance of grounding uh, at all applications, particularly digital. And if you happen to own a, a power distributor that has a ground terminal on it, that is, goes to chassis or earth ground, or you have products that have an earth ground terminal on them, like many of the Asian products do, Lumen, or Render, things like that, you should use that ground terminal and connect it to a proper earth ground on a power distributor um, uh, because it will make things notably quieter. So we can talk about this more offline if you want some time because I've been doing a lot of work on this. Um, and lastly, I'll just give a big thumbs up for Norm's services. If you need a room, you know, Norm for consulting, for rooms, he's your guy. So that's kind of all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Stephen. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, very good. And uh, Lawrence Brown from San Francisco, you'll be our last questioner. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I have a um, quick question. I don't think it's been um, um, discussed yet. Um, and it has to do with electrical noise and the discussions about transformers and, and isolation transformers and things. And briefly, um, Norm's comment about, in general, power conditioners. And that is, um, there are... <laughs> The last several years, there's been many companies or several companies, and I'm sure most people know who, who they are, who that are, who've now talked about um, <clears throat> component to component noise or com component induced noise affecting other components in the systems, mm -hmm. in their audio systems, has been uh, much more important than noise coming from the outside via the grid. Um, and um, the discussion we've had so far that Norm has been um, addressing are noises kind of like coming from electrical noises coming from outside the, the listening room, like via the grid or other or other things. Can you make any comments? Do you have any feelings about these um, components or component um, noise issues, supposed noise issues, and if how real are they? And if they are, are there ways that we can control them? Or, or I don't know, your feelings? Um, well, um, they're real for sure. Um, they're less common than the other external uh, interferences that we've been talking about. Um, and typically, if there's a, a problem, then I'd, I'd say it's, you know, there's a source in the system that uh, is the problem. Usually it has something to do with, uh, of course, it, it could be anything. It could be uh, EMI or RFI type of interference, either line coupled or field coupled, um, or it might be an impedance mismatch. But in general, I'm, I'm saying that if there's a problem with a particular component introducing noise, then I would call that a problem and it should be investigated and, and, uh, and determined and, and rectified. I just add a quick comment to that, to piggyback off Norm. Most of the noise in folks' systems comes from the full wave bridge rectifiers and the power supplies of the components themselves. And because it's AC, the current goes both ways. It goes in the component and back out of the component. Yeah. So this is why this component to component isolation approach is so important. Most of the noise in your system comes from this, the gear in your system's power supplies. Yeah, you know, um, we talked about an isolation transformer for the system, but I recommend isolation of all the components. Like for example, with, the, with what I did for uh, Skywalker back, you know, their scoring facility back in the mid nineties, um, that was pretty innovative. Now they had their own power source themselves for their, their place. Um, they have their own fire department. <laughs> they were completely off the grid. However, the scoring facility still had issues. And 
So what I introduced besides a technical grounding grid was lots of isolation. They already had a separately derived system, but what we ended up isolating in addition was analog from digital, recording from playback, and, and so forth. Norm, thank you so much. I, how, how's the weather there? I, uh, it's It has mellowed out just recently, so we survived. Uh, okay. That's a good thing. Yeah, so at least you, you didn't get taken off the grid. Um, right. And neither did I. So very successful meeting. And and uh, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for hanging out for so long. Um, it's been uh, it's been great, very educational, entertaining. And uh, but we had so many questions, and I think we got good answers. So thank you so much. Great. Well, again, thank you so much. And and you know, if, if there's some topics that you want uh, in in the future. Um, I'm I'm here.